PCI DSS controls are not going to save you. And that PCI DSS or PCI data, or even in the medical side, um, PHI data, right? That stuff is super valuable, especially to bad guys. And, and they're hunting for it as, as we see. So Fin7 being a classic example of adversaries that go for organizations that might not have robust controls in place or have just enough to get by and they might have two Owens and that's it for a global enterprise, right? They have offices in like London, they have offices in, you know, New Zealand or whatever, but they're very small and they're in a startup like mentality or maybe they've grown beyond the startup mentality and they just don't have the manpower because it's like the meme, right? It's like uh, the guy opening his wallet and there's like a little fly coming out. It's like security budget before a breach. <laughs> and then it's like security budget after a breach. And he's like Scrooge McDuck swimming in money, right? Classic example. And so. Hello, and welcome to the Cybrary podcast. I'm your host, Will Carlson, Senior Director of Content here at Cybrary, and I have the distinct privilege today to be joined by not one, but two amazing guests today. So I'm joined by Matt Mullins and Owen Dubell, both instructors here uh, for Cybrary, among many of the other things that they do, both professionally and for Cybrary as an organization. So to get started, I'll let uh, Matt and Owen go into the cage match and figure out who's going to give their introduction first. So take it away, Owen and Matt. I'll go first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Will. Owen Dubell here. Um, so been working with Cybrary almost a year now, actually, if you can believe it. Uh, um, uh, primarily uh, focusing on the, the defensive realm of, of security, uh, as well as um, I'm a security engineer full time as well. Um, I've been doing that going on eight years now, uh, private sector, uh, again, primarily defensive security, um, larger enterprises is my, my main focus, but I have worked with some mid-sized companies as well. Great. Thanks, Owen. All Matt, right. over to uh, you. Thanks. Uh, Matt Mullins. So I do uh, adversary simulation for Cyberry. I'm the chief thief, I guess you could say. And uh, <laughs> uh, I've been in this field for about a decade. And um, yeah, I've been around for about the same amount of time that Owen has been. So I've been enjoying uh, developing courses with Owen, uh, developing courses with Jen, who's one of our course managers as well. And then also Clint Keir, who does the offensive penetration testing. And my full-time experience has been mostly fintech, um, also some healthcare. And uh, in all those roles, I've been either a penetration tester or red team operator or lead, uh, currently operating as a senior manager for a red team. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Chief Thief, you better be careful, Matt. That, that one's going <laughs> to stick whether you want it to or not. So I hope you're ready to hold on to that one for a while. <laughs> well, sounds like a tattoo idea. <laughs> <laughs> we can, I'm sure we can commission some designs and make that happen, Owen. We'll, we'll start a that's GoFundMe right. campaign or something, right? <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us today. It's a really interesting topic uh, up for discussion today, and it really is uh, aligning to our recent launch of the Ransomware Threat Actor campaign, right? So, um, you know, this is definitely not as all of our podcasts, none of our podcasts are, and this is not a sales plug for Cybrary, but we picked this threat actor campaign, the, the framework that we did, the topic that we did, the threat group that we did, all very intentionally. And I wanted to take some time to talk to you both about your perspectives uh, about this work, how it came together, why it was relevant, why we chose what we did. Um, just to, you know, to give the audience some understanding about, you know, both the the topic at hand uh, of the campaign, the threat actor that we chose, and you know why thinking about things the way that we have when we created this content are really important, not just for Cyber as an organization, but for security teams uh, across the globe as they're trying to respond to um, you know chief thieves like Matt in the wild, trying to trying to to get the the crown jewels as it were. Um, and for those in the audience that don't know, the, the Threat Actor campaign that we rolled out was based on ransomware, uh, something you may hopefully have heard of, maybe not hopefully, but you certainly have heard of in the space. Um, and we also aligned to Fin7 as a threat group that Matt was going to come in and, and emulate. But I wanted to start uh, with some background on ransomware and, and, you know, why did we choose ransomware? Why was that an important topic for this group to cover in this particular campaign, Matt or Owen? I'll go ahead and take that one on the mat. Um, 
So essentially, I mean, like you said, well, everyone's probably heard of ransomware, hopefully not experienced it. Um, but I mean, everyone's seen the stats, doesn't matter, you know, what your source is. But I mean, uh, I got one here from Sophos that says in 2020, over 51% of surveyed businesses were victim to ransomware, right? Now, who knows what that, that sample size is, but that's still 50% of, of a population that is affected by ransomware. And then if you've, you know, read the Verizon DBI, our report at all, um, you've seen the shocking numbers in there. Um, I mean, numbers around even of that 51% that are affected, only 57% are actually able to reclaim their data after the fact, right? Those are, those are huge statistics and they can affect anybody. It's not just large scale enterprise or mom and pop shop that, you know, doesn't maybe put their, their best foot forward as far as security goes. Um, at the end of the day, anyone can be affected by ransomware. And I mean, numbers don't lie. And the, the payout numbers that you see as well are astronomical. Um, I think I've seen, it was the DBIR that, that posted a, a prediction number for 2031 that there would be $265 billion in ransomware payouts. If the trend that we're on currently keeps continuing year after year, I mean, that's, that's less than 10 years away. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are really phenomenal statistics. I know I just read in the news the other day that there was a, a a university that has recently and unfortunately closed their doors in combination to a number of factors. But I think the you know the final the, the final blow to them was uh, a ransomware campaign that they ultimately weren't able to recover from. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it definitely is a, a, a non discriminant impact that has continued to grow. Uh, and change and and have significant monetary impact to organizations. Um, I wonder too, so ransomware has been around for a, a fair bit of time. Um, mm-hmm. Does it look exactly the same now as it has in the past? And if not, what have been some of the changes in the way we're seeing ransomware in the wild? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in. <laughs> uh, throw my hat in the ring on that one. Um, yeah, so obviously some of the stuff stays the same, but a lot of stuff has changed to your point, Will, right? So their standard attack process of getting in encrypting and exfiltrating and things like that. Sure, that's a pretty standard issue, but where they've kind of wisened up is they also can do some extortion on top of that or maybe a double layer of extortion. You know, some of the cyber threat intelligence that I've seen outside of threatening to leak the information to the dark web, regardless if they pay that, they'll hit them with a second ransom. Okay, well, you can have your data back potentially now, but on top of that, if you don't pay us more, We'll, we'll leak that information, right? And you'll end up in a database somewhere and then it'll be in the news and it's going to impact your bottom line or your shareholders' information. Speaking of shareholders, though, also, I've also seen uh, from reporting that they're now targeting the shareholders as they breach, right? So now they say, hey, we're in your organization. We've encrypted your data. We've exfiltrated your data. This is going to impact the business that you hold shares for. What are you going to do about it? So now you've got like this triple threat where it's like, we've got your data, we're going to potentially leak your data. And now we're also targeting the people who drive the big decisions for the business. And so to your point, Will, that you were talking about, um, and then also one that you were talking about for the actual payout for that. I mean, those numbers don't really surprise me too bad. And they're probably going to get a lot worse, like you said, Owen, because with that information out there, and then the trends that I think we saw a couple of years ago where they're talking about, do you want to have ransomware insurance? Do you want to have budget set aside just in case to pay out? I mean, that means that it's big enough of a, of a profit margin for the bad guys that they can depend on that. And now businesses are now allotting for that almost like a, like a cyber shrink approach, right? You know, with inventory and like, you know, grocery stores and stuff. So it's definitely evolved and it's definitely become much more of a big business, especially with ransomware as a service and those software suites being available and, you know, cutting edge uh, things being rolled into them as detections improve. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nasty. Um, Owen, I'm, I'm sure you probably got some feedback on that one too. So. Yeah, no, it's, um, it, even if, again, the, the impact is, is the same, if not worse, but um, the, I mean, some of the, the different tactics and techniques, um, there's a lot of them that we're able to, to map out and, and really explain. But I mean, look at, if you just take a look at, at MITRE and what they've laid out, They've added sub techniques and those continuously grow. So it's, you know, what I'm saying it's ever shifting, it's ever growing, but um, it's it's definitely a, a, a financially beneficial, you know, engagement for these threat actors because 
they keep coming after it and they keep pursuing it with ransomware. Yeah. Yeah, you hit on something that I wanted to lean into, Matt. You you must have gotten the answer key today. You you, <laughs> you you have something on my computer I need to know about, Matt. Um, <laughs> it, and that's the, the as a service model of this, right? So now na- so now it's you know ransomware is the objective on goal. Got a lot of different ways I can ultimately do that. But now we're seeing, uh, and I'm I'm leaning into your area a whole lot more. So correct me if I'm off the rails, but. We're seeing groups cooperating and specializing in certain parts of this attack chain. So you may have a gang, a group that only handles the ransomware, the actual objectives on goal, once somebody has gotten initial access. So mm-hmm. you're seeing a lot of partnering and cooperation and as a service across these groups that really allow them to specialize and hone their skills on one particular piece of the attack. And mm-hmm. in a you know what some may not realize, in a very organized crime sort of way, I wonder, um, you know, Am I on base? Uh, am I missing anything here? And, and what are the impacts of that, really, having a, a group that can specialize on one particular piece of the attack? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, right? So to your point, you might have a group that is really good with a post-exploitation kit. They get in somehow, but once they're in, that is their soup du jour. They can carve it up like a Thanksgiving turkey, right? But the problem is getting that initial access. So obviously, it's a coevolution thing, right? If we know that we're having problems getting in and the gang across the street or, you know, on the dark web forum or whatever that we chit chat with, hey, we can't get in. We need an exploit kit. Oh, well, you know, my ransomware group or my, you know, threat actor group or software group or whatever, we specialize in that initial access. And we're really good with this phishing kit. So now let's, why don't we merge them together and make a really, really nasty double hitter? Makes total sense. I mean, from a business perspective, then we think about uh, mergers and acquisitions with, you know, a primary, you know, modus operandi, right? Hey, we make really good engines. Well, that's great. We make great bodies, but you know, we don't really make great engines. It would behoove us to either, you know, acquire that business or, you know, work very closely with them as a non-integrated subsidiary or something like that. So that now we make a great, you know, engine frame setup. Now let's go get someone who can do paint, can do electrical wiring, things like that. And as those things come together, we know we're gonna make a profit margin to the point that we talked about earlier, because I mean, you know, we're making billions of dollars a year and if we have someone who has the time, the dedication, especially with like uh, more sophisticated threat actors, where they might specialize in things with that initial access, right? Because endpoint detections, right? And antivirus and things like that, they're always updating, they're always changing. So you need someone who's really specialized in that initial access, but they might not be the best at, you know, the quick enumeration, pivoting and, you know, uh, on a magic per se scripting to to move from SMB share to SMB share or something like that. So having those different groups work together totally makes sense from a business perspective. And obviously from a sophistication level makes total sense because it's difficult to have all those skill sets in one house. I can speak from the red team side, especially on that. Like a very large red teams usually will have a delineation of specialization, right? Just like we discussed, hey, someone's really good at fishing. They're really good at social engineering. They're going to be the person that calls up the recruiter and says, oh man, you got to run macros on my resume because that's the only way you're going to see it, right? They know that they can get in that way. And then there's someone who knows how to write those macros well enough that they won't get detected by whatever, you know, Windows Defender or whatever the, the business is using. And so now that's the initial breach to your point, Will. And now where are we going to go from there? We need someone who specializes in Active Directory, if it's an Active Directory-based business, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you definitely see that stuff. And it's, it's, I'm sure it's going to get much more sophisticated, you know, and um, that's why things like when the Conti playbook was leaked, you know, that was like such a big like, whoa, you know, now we have their actual playbook. We can tell like what their specialization is. And there's some stuff from the red teamer slash adversary, you know, simulation and emulation side that, you know, I can say that myself and some of my other peers in the professional circle were like, well, this really wasn't too impressive. Well, that wasn't their strong point to your point, right? They might be really poor and, you know, pivoting or something like that or, or initial access, but where do they specialize? Oh, we've got great software for encryption and exfiltration, 100%. Right. Just depends. Yeah. So I can see where that paints a picture, Matt, that that the adversaries are continuing to get better. And as they specialize, they'll get better and better at the piece they get better at. But that doesn't leave them short sighted because they're leveraging other adversary groups that are equally specialized in other parts. So for defenders like Owen, you know, better or for worse, Owen, that means we're increasingly going up against folks that have more and more specialization in a lot of ways for security teams that have you know, still a massive mandate, uh, a fixed budget, um, you know, wear three or four different hats to get it done. And it can quickly 
quickly become overwhelming. And you couple that to, you know, with the, the motivation at being, you know, financial gain. So if there's profit, we're going to continue to do it. As long as we're making money, we'll continue to specialize our tool sets and try to find other uh, threat actor groups that we can partner with to get the job done because we're all, we're all making plenty of money. Um, I'm getting it done. I wonder to that point, how important is the motivation of the threat actor group to both Matt on your side, if you're emulating them, how that shows up in the way the campaign is pieced together? And then Owen, are there any learnings for, for you as a defender in that how does having somebody come in for financial gain look different than say somebody coming in for cyber espionage or, or hacktivism? Gotcha. Yeah, I can start off. Um, okay. And actually to touch on, on Matt's part about, you know, originally with the, the threat actors uh, being able to leverage each other for their services and based on their skill sets. Unfortunately, from the defensive side, that that has to be the shift as well in order to keep up. At, you know, many people know on the defensive side, it's a game of keep up where we're usually never ahead. If anything, they're always a step ahead and we're just playing catch up. Is it, Even if you have preventative controls in place and everything lined up, um, they're usually one step ahead. So, it, you know, unfortunately, um, on the on the the traditional ways of security with someone wearing three or four hats and it, it's got to, sh- it's got to shift and it's got to grow into a realm of you have to, you know, it's, it's okay to play that role for a while, but you have to be able to leverage not only skill sets, but also different tool sets as well in order, you know, you, you can't always just run what's open source and expect it to work forever. You know, it sometimes you got to level up, you know, in order to, to stay ahead of the game. Sorry, what was your your original question there? I kind of I just wanted to touch on that before I forgot. Yeah, no, it's yeah, no, no, it's on. great. I, I was curious, leaning into how does the motive of the threat group cause it to show up differently for you um, as a defender, if it does at all? Yeah, I mean, I guess initially um, you can't really tell the difference, but once obviously, if if they do get inside. Um, you'll, you'll start to see them tearing towards whatever jewels that they're after. Um, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if someone's, if someone's after you from a, um, a disgruntled perspective or trying to deface you, it's, it usually happens pretty quickly. Um, and it's more of like a reactive, okay, we need to take this down or, you know, and then patch it and fix it and be done with it. Um, whereas if it's somebody financially motivated, they're, if they're good, they're going to take their time and they're going to ensure that once they got this payload, once they launch it, I mean, the cat's out of the bag, you know, so um, they're going to want to take their time with with their reconnaissance and, and with their lateral movements, make sure they're covering their tracks um, to, to gain a solid foothold before they release that beast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just kind of to, to dovetail off that point from from Owen, I mean, it really from the from the red team slash adversary side, we're going to orient towards whatever our objective is that makes the most sense, right? So if they're going in for PCI information, kind of like what he was saying, you want we want to make sure that we have set the trap appropriately. So then when we detonate it, we've got the data, we've already exfiltrated however much we need or whatever we're trying to get, and then we ransomware kind of burned the ground, and then we we've, we've exited out, and then we start you know, the harassment campaign, um, you know, maybe it's an extortion, we want information, right? Similar approach, we want to get in, identify what critical systems, which takes a lot of time, because I can tell you from the, the red team side, when we get in, if we're truly doing a, a real threat simulation or, or em- emulation, right, we, we don't know anything about the organization. We've just breached. We've got somebody to fire our payload. We've got our call back to our C2 infrastructure. You know, we built in our OPSEC, which that takes a lot of time to what Owen was talking about. You know, we have protections. So now we're in this position where we've got an initial beachhead. We need to build up resilience internally. Again, takes time, right? So now that we built resilience and we're inside the organization and we're looking around, we're like, I have no idea what system would handle, you know, um, critical business decision information, where would that be? Would that be in their Outlook like server, Exchange server? Would that maybe be on local high-level uh, individuals or high-value individuals like executives? So we need to target them. And then we start iterating through enumeration. Is it Active Directory-based? Is it mostly a Mac shop? Do they use JAMF or JAMF? I don't know. So we got to learn, set the snare, and then wait for the rabbit to run through it, right? 
So it takes time um, versus like you were talking about, Owen, like, you know, if it's just a, we want to go in and we want to deface things and we want to make a political statement or something like that, that could be as simple as finding on some edge case, you know, situations with like EC2, inst- EC2 instances or maybe subdomains, you know, subdomain takeover or hijacking, um, you know, DNS, expired domains or things like that, point them in the correct location. And then we have our defaced website for our political or whatever message that we're trying to send. So each one, um, drives a different perspective, just exactly like what Owen said, and, and depending on how critical or how serious it is, because take, take into consideration, um, someone who, who handles thousands, millions of credit card transactions a day, obviously, their security is going to be much better. So we want to take our time and think, okay, what's the best vector to get in? How do we build that resilience? Maybe we run a secondary campaign, knowing that campaign is going to get burned, right? So we've got our initial connections back to our C2. And now we want to we poke the badger a little bit. We want to harass the Owens of the world. And we want to say, hey, look, we're over here. We're over here. And then we DDoS something of low value. And then while they're doing that, we run in through the back door and we steal the money and get out, right? I mean, true tactics, true ninja tactics, as they would say, right? So it's just, um, and, and I really want to, in all honesty and clear channel, I really want to emphasize like the defender job will always be harder. You know, our job is wherever the castle is, we can circle it day and night. We can look for that one stone that's loose. Maybe they had alligators in the moat and they got sick and they all died and defenders don't know that, right? You know, <laughs> Sysmon's not firing on the right rule. And, and and they can only see so much because, you know, they're a small team that's overworked. Whereas with us, you know, we've got lots of time and time yeah, there's a your, lot of blue yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So just want to emphasize that and, and, and being totally playing fair and being nice. The, the defender job is is the prize fighter and we're the training partner when it comes to red teaming and, and emulation adversaries. But the bad guys, you know, they're the Mike Tysons. They're the, uh, they're the ones coming for the title belt. That's right. Now, now Matt, I will say too, I, I, I might have had somebody on the podcast here recently that you happen to know. Uh, and, and Clinton, I may have been talking about, you know, I, I think effectively he really agreed that being a pin tester is so much easier than an adversary emulator. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know that's not exactly what he said, and I'm going to get a message later when he sees the episode. It's like, that is not what I said, Carlton. <laughs> but we definitely did have some conversation about the differences between what he does as a pen tester, getting to come in and kind of be as noisy as he wants to be versus what a red teamer does. To your point, you alluded to this, right? And being a little craftier, being a little bit quieter, trying to do some more things that more closely emulates what an adversary is going to do. And I wonder, um, you know, somewhat in retort to Clint's uh, uh, comments from the previous episode allow you to, to enumerate on that a little bit about the differences, you know, just quickly between being a pen tester and a, an adversary emulator a, as you yeah. want. Sure. So it's uh, pirates versus ninjas or Vikings versus ninjas. I've, I've heard it explained as well. You know, uh, to Clint's point, they want to go in and they want to find all the vulnerabilities. So they're just smashing things, tearing them apart. They don't worry about detections. They don't worry about, you know, really smart cats like Owen hunting for them in the environment. Whereas with the red team, we, we know what we have to get to. We're not worried about identifying all the vulnerabilities, but we know out there, there's a predator looking for us. There's an Owen, right? So we have to move furtively and orient here appropriately. And usually the time box is a lot larger too. I'm sure Clint probably talked about this with pen tests. You might have a week for an app. So you can throw the kitchen sink at it, you know, just fan the hammer on the poor thing. And as long as it stands up in dev environment, you keep hitting it with whatever scanner or sophisticated attack. And I know Clint's super, super smart guy as well. And so he might have that running in the background while he also does his, his like more sophisticated manual, you know, assessment with us. Everything has to be custom. Everything has to be well thought out. Usually with most operators, they'll have two operators working on one console, right? So if, if Owen and I are on a red team operation and you know, we're going through the environment and we accidentally come across something of high value, right? Like say we're talking about PCI database or something like that. We have to think about what are the ramifications for an internal organization, which is one step between us and the adversary, right? So we have to have a second set of eyes for safety. Um, so there's a number of things that go into consideration, but we do have time and usually there's a great deal of spin up, right? So if we're going to be using some degree of custom malware, we have to create that custom malware. <laughs> if that's going to be in C++, so that's going to be something that we're using in C Sharp, or is it going to be VBA, the most unholy of languages outside of JavaScript? I mean, whatever we're going to use, we have to have the time to develop that, right? And so you have to have, I, mean, I say in, on our team and stuff like that, it's time to sharpen the sticks before you go hunt in the woolly mammoth. And you just got to bake all of that in. Whereas with the pen test, you know, it's like, hey, 
you know, your TDY is, you know, this perimeter web application that has, you know, um, a SQL backend or something like that. It's, you know, okay, well, we've got some information. Whereas with us, hey, attack, you know, Bob's Burgers or something like that, dot com. And that's it. That's all we've got. And then it's all right, off to the races. So a little bit of a difference. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> No doubt. Yeah, Matt, you mentioned this. I'm curious what you both, you know, I, I think it's interesting that you've mentioned PCI uh, data because that dovetails really well. It is a phenomenal segue. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> into our selection of Fin7 for this particular ransomware campaign and, and why we chose them. So, so curious why that's relevant um, and how that showed up for the both of you in this particular campaign because we were emulating that particular adversary. Well, go first, Owen. I don't want to talk the whole time. <laughs> yes. So essentially, I mean, obviously, Fin7, if you look them up by definition, you know, they cover, um, I mean, they, they attack a multitude of different industries. Obviously, banking institutions and financial institutions are number one. But they also cover food, hospitality, retail, you know, you name it, right? Um, but really, I think for me, what really drew me to this project and honestly, it was kind of the whole timing of this whole remote shift, you know, a majority of businesses because of COVID had to shift everybody home, right? So the landscape changed, right? Um, so that gave a lot of these these um, threat actors like and threat groups like Fin7 a, a greater opportunity, not only to, hey, there's less guards watching the moat type deal, but also um, now these companies' networks have now expanded right? They're now people's home networks in some situations. Sure, they may have VPNs for, that allow, you know, their users to connect in to access certain resources. But a lot of those machines also probably aren't required to have the VPN on at all times, right? And at the end of the day, I would imagine 85% or 90% of users' home networks are probably not as secure as, you know, their workplace. So, that's really kind of what drew me to the the whole, you know, uh, Fin7 um, uh, starting with them essentially was just they, they, they looked like a good opportunity to really showcase um, well, what the, the true uh, potentials of ransomware could be um, on a larger scale. You know, it, it may not just be something that's exploiting your business, um, you know, at the workplace or on premise. Uh, it could affect your, your users, too. And ultimately if you know you know they're going to go after the weakest link and the weakest link is the humans 85% of breaches are there's a human element to it um and if you know and that would directly tie to your reputation if it was your users home network or your your enterprise network yeah, the, the media and the PR team aren't really going to care about that distinction, are they? At the end yeah. of the day, your organization no. breached, you were ransomware, and now all of your data, all of your customers' data, PII, PCI data, card information is is out there. Yeah. In the, in the it's wild, probably right? less. Con it's probably harder for them to actually control if someone, if their individual, even if they had a personal side business or whatever, right? They can't control that. Then, they, if that person goes on Facebook and says, "Oh, I was hacked," da 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 da, or whatever. Um, yep. it, that's a PR nightmare. Got him, coach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, one thing I wanted to, I wanted to pull on a little bit too, like you kind of called out Owen is like those medium sized businesses, right. You know, with everything going remote and everything going, like you said, in this position where they're processing card data online, you know, they might have some containerization with something like Stripe right? What we've all seen. We've all like checked out like an e-commerce website, Stripe, you know, just uh, put your information processed by PayPal or whatever, right? Um, those businesses, I guarantee you, smaller to medium-sized businesses and also with a star, asterisk, whatever, healthcare, because healthcare is a different can of worms in regards to security of just general stuff. Um, you know, I'm sure they haven't been through like an exhaustive PCI DSS assessment where they've had like, you know, their, their actual scanning vendor come in and like run a full scan and be like, yep, you've containerized all your information correctly. You've encrypted this and encrypted that. And even with PCI, thinking about it from the perspective of what does PCI DSS do as a standard, right? It's, it's a minimum set of controls to protect cardholder data, like you were saying, Owen. So with all of that being said, certain things, one, are going to be out of scope for that assessment, like the end user's network, like you called out. But then also with these small to medium-sized businesses, 
who knows? They might have, I think it was, it's, it's a rock form, like a PCI DSS rock form back from a long time ago when I did PCI DSS. Uh, it's essentially like an attestation of risk where we've accepted this risk and, and this is what we're, you know. So <laughs> the government does it all the time, right? You know, we do it all the time with like PCI DSS for small businesses. And so if they write those things away, it might be a sense of, hey, we're PCI DSS compliant. We have 3,000 rocks in a file somewhere that we don't want you to see, but the auditors are happy because we've checked all the boxes. Right. And then along <laughs> comes a spider, right? Or Fin7 or whatever. And then they get in, they run that, and it's all that paperwork doesn't matter at the end of the day. And this is, a, am sure I probably talked about this in the, the other podcast about red teaming and maybe even Clint talked about it. All that stuff is, all those controls are to keep, you know, the wolves out. Well, we're, we're the wolves, you know, and, you know, the adversary didn't follow our plan. The adversary didn't uh, adhere to our audit requirements. Well, adversaries don't care. They don't care. <laughs> we want in to get the money and get out. We want to win. We want to capture the flag and then run laughing in the distance, right? And so that's why, again, like the importance of a good, uh, diverse team, like you were talking about, about Owen, right? Specialization and things like that, because PCI DSS controls are not going to save you. And that PCI DSS or PCI data, or even in the medical side, um, PHI data, right? That stuff is super valuable, especially to bad guys. And, and they're hunting for it as, as we see. So Fin7 being a classic example of adversaries that go for organizations that might not have robust controls in place or have just enough to get by. And they might have two Owens and that's it for a global enterprise, right? They have offices in like London, they have offices in, you know, New Zealand or whatever, but they're very small and they're in a startup like mentality, or maybe they've grown beyond the startup mentality and they just don't have the manpower because it's like the meme, right? It's like a uh, guy opening his wallet and there's like a little fly coming out. It's like security budget before a breach. <laughs> and then it's like security budget after a breach. And he's like Scrooge McDuck swimming in money, right? Classic example. And so yeah. I just wanted to call that out and pull it out as well, because you made some good points on it. Yeah, no doubt. So ransomware is important. <laughs> I think we've done a pretty good job of talking about why that was an important topic to us, right? And why that was something that we wanted to focus on for this first campaign in particular. It has seen some changes. It's grown. It's continuing to evolve and morph, right? So it's just one objective on goal. Um, you know, as soon as we feel like as IT and security practitioners that we've we've got them cornered and we have good backups and we've solved the problem, now they start extorting us, extorting our buyers, extorting our board. Dang it, we're back in the race again, and all of a sudden, ransomware is another good objective on goal, as it's always been. I think it's interesting from the to call out and circle back to our, our, our conversation about this being for financial gain, right? Matt, I think that's that's really, to me, where it shows up that why the organizations are targeted that, targeted that are targeted is it's an easy investment. I can get in. It's relatively easy to deploy my payload and get what it is that I'm after. So my ROI on these engagements for an organization that... They have to have enough of something I'm interested in, right? Like, yeah. great if they have thousands and thousands of people's PHI or PII or card data, and they've got a couple of people on a security team, and they they may or may not think that they're outsourcing some of that. So I can get in, I can get what I need, I can get out, and I can make a quick return. Yep. And since So because I'm doing this for financial gain, I'm turning as fast as I possibly can on those, which I think to circles back to these groups partnering together, right? So if I've got this a great ransomware capability as a service, and I can partner with somebody that's got a long list of initial access, we can start comparing notes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I find that my ransomware payload tends to work best when these conditions are true. Who on your menu of folks you have initial access fits my bill, and we can turn on these really quickly and make a heck of a profit really fast. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I hope for the audience that, you know, not wanting to live in the world of fear, uncertainty and doubt, because I don't think it's that right. I mean, it's just the facts. Um, yep. It's how this is working now and what we're seeing. Um, it's a little bit of a bleak environment and circling back to, you know, the comment made about where these stats are likely to grow to if they continue at the current pace. Um, we've got to do something about it as an, as, as an industry, right? And I think, again, circling back, that's why I think all of us felt really important about this particular campaign and picking this particular adversary because they were a pain point that shows up um, in industry today that if we can do a better job of detecting and preventing this particular attack or attacks like it, then that would be a huge service mm -hmm. um, for the space. Yeah. 
Yeah, and one thing I was going to throw out there too is, is the net, right? There's so many small to medium-sized businesses that are out there that are vulnerable and, and kind of like what you were calling out off of Owen's point. If we just cast the net, we might not get all the small to medium-sized businesses, but when we do, we get a huge payout. So we just throw the net out there and catch the fish that we can, and then we wait, and then we update our net a little bit and throw the net back out there and cycle, rinse, repeat. So to, like you said, uh, Will, it's, it's not going to go away, and it's, it's something that's pretty classic uh, in regards to you know, standard threat actor activity, you know, cyber criminal group activity. Yeah, I wonder for you both, um, I know in some conversations I've had um, with cybersecurity professionals, there's, there's some discussion about how important is it, why is it important, when is it important to really look at uh, cyber threat intelligence and begin to, you know, at what point do I model my defenses after an adversary that has some known behaviors and kind of where does CTI or cyber threat intelligence really fit in? Um, I ask a different way. I think we could have built this campaign completely out of your head, Matt, about what you've experienced and what you think would work. And we could have done it in a way that was just really easy to illustrate in the lab. Uh, but obviously, we didn't do that for a reason. And I think it's because we all believe that there's a lot to be said for when you're trying to assess and emulate, doing it in a way that a real adversary would do so that you're not just being academic about this exercise, but that you're doing it in a way that's likely to be something that really shows up. And, and I'm curious what you both think about that, both um, in your professional experience, how does CTI show up? Why is it important to know what the bad guys are doing outside of, you know, oh, and potentially just going in and pulling down a list of, of detections that you can consume into the SIM and saying that's good enough. So yeah, how does well, CTI show up? Why, why does looking at this or the adversary lens really matter? Well, it's all, honestly, from a defensive side, it, it's all about fine tuning what you're seeing. You, like you said, you could pull down all those those rules and implement them in your sim as detections or dashboards or whatever you want. Um, you'll be surprised at, well, probably won't be surprised. Computers make a lot of noise on a network. And it all, when you're looking at it in the logs, it looks really bad. <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking at cross communication and it's never quiet. So you're going to have a ton of false positives going off from the get-go if you just grab some base set rules and throw them in there. Um, and what will happen is it, your thought process may be, okay, I'll throw them all in there and I'll, I'll slowly tune them out. Well, what will happen is you'll get a serious alert fatigue and you'll ignore them outright. Yep. You may start tuning them out, but they will never end because technology is always changing. There's new technology, new operating systems, everything. So by bringing in that, that threat intelligence piece, um, you're really adding an additional layer. And that's what defensive security really is all about, is adding as many layers as you can feasibly. Um, so you're adding that layer of, of, I don't, affirmation, if anything, to what you're seeing to say, hey, these nine in, in this time period are false positives, but this one has a threat indicator tied to it. I'm gonna look more into this one because for some reason, I have an additional piece of information that I don't have with the other ones, right? So you're just adding context to, to what you're seeing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to, to copy on that too, right? So we talk about threat hunting, we, thought, we talk about adversary emulation, you know, and, and strategy and tactics and things like that. You know, uh, TTPs extracted from cyber threat intelligence, you know, tactics, techniques, and procedures that might be used by individual groups tied to MITRE, for example. Um, Super important from the from the adversary emulation and simulation side, because you know if we're emulating 100% what an adversary is doing, or we're simulating up to a certain amount what an adversary is doing, we want to make sure that it's commensurate to who we're we're trying to mimic, right? So that to Owen's point, we have correct detection validation, and we also have a correct scenario for uh, Owen's side of the house to hunt us down, right? Because who knows, they might change one TTP and then get in with that one thing, right? And so with that one thing that they've changed, kind of like we were talking about earlier, they might pull in a different, you know, um, criminal group and they might say, hey, we have a really great dropper that we've developed. And then, you know, Fin7 says, hey, that sounds great. Let's roll that in because our dropper is kind of weak sauce and now we've got a way in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those TTPs driving the actual, uh, the actual process that we're emulating off of, super important. And, and like what Owen said, 
when you're hunting too, when you have, you know, tons of noise and very little signal that you're going off of, there's a lot of signal or uh, detection fatigue, like you were saying. So having the capability to say, hey, we've got one TTP that, that, that triggered off of Sysmon or OS query or whatever. And then you look kind of in the, the blast radius and you see two other small ones that seem to tie to that threat actor group's TTPs. Okay, now we have something that we want to really detect off of. And that's great too from, from the side of the red team or you know the ad sim slash ad MU side because then we can say, all right, great. If we're doing a purple team, chase that, chase that lead. You know, like the little rabbit that's on the, uh, the, the racetrack for greyhounds it fires off and it goes like, go after it, chase it down. You know, um, you're onto something. And it might be something that if it's a true red team, we don't say directly to them, hey, hey, chase that down. But when we speak to white cell, you know, and they say, hey, what is this? Then the leadership for the IR side might say, run your playbooks. We don't know if it's red team or not, but run your playbooks. And that is the benefit of the exercise because it, it, it keeps the cats like Owen, you know, able to detect what's important versus the, you know, the noise, the signal noise ratio. But then also it's, it's a validating thing because I mean, you know, the inverse of that is, is if there's a poor leadership in incident response, they might not, you know, want to do those things, or they might not, you know, encourage that type of growth and activity and the diversification of skill sets. And then all of a sudden you get a, a kind of a negative situation where, oh, here comes Red Team. It's a public execution. Here's their report about how they got into the thing, you know, and that's the opposite of what you want because you want to train up. You want to cha- train up your champion like we were talking about. They're the defenders. They're the most important people when it comes to network security. They're the ones that are defending the network, right? So at the end of the day, my job is predicated on his job being, you know, uh, a value and, and him doing a good job. So um, all those things to say, CTI being a huge driver in regards to, you know, those things. Like a great case in point, uh, one of my buddies, uh, Chris Fuller, he is, works in cyber threat intelligence. And I was having a conversation with him a few days prior about the... Um, uh, the situation with the the shareholder slash board extortion. I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, things change. I mean, and, and I'm not, I mean, we, we, from the red team side or the adversary emulation simulation side, we're not experts at, you know, crawling the dark web for, you know, this information. So having a good team that feeds the red team. So then the red team can then feed a good exercise to IR. So then IR gets pumped up. So then when they do fight against Fin7 or you know, whatever group, Profit Spider or something like that, they're prepared. They know what they're up against. They know what the deltas could be. And they're like, you know, we're not afraid of them. We have detections in place. We have fair confidence. So it's, it's, it's very important, I would say. Yeah, and I, I'm sure this is a safe comment to, to make. I, I know in my career, I've never worked in an organization that had infinite budget for these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or if they did, they weren't definitely... It, security may not have been where they were spending their infinite budget, as it were. Yeah. And I think where I see CTI show up and be really, really important is it's just one of you know many of the tools I think that we have to exercise and use to help us prioritize. Mm-hmm. Set a different way, budget outside of it, right? So I mean, Owen has only got so many hours of every day. And if to your point, if all I do is go in and turn all the detections, I'm going to get alert fatigue the IT or the, the the engineers are going to be banging down my door because I'm eclipsing my storage and we're running out of space. So a whole host of fall on things happen. Like we either start turning alerts down, turning them off, culling our logs sooner. Yep. Heaven knows that our dwell time for these things is phenomenal, right? So a week of logs is more than enough. Yeah. No, definitely not more than enough. But there's all these fall ons when you're trying to do too much without direction that I think Stopping as an organization and realizing who are the threats that are likely yes. to be interested in what I have, yep. It, yep. it just causes you to be a lot more self-reflective of what do I have that people might actually want? Who might actually want it? And how might they show up realistically? How have they been observed showing up to go after similar things to what I have? And it's just a really great forcing function like even if you don't have the privilege to have a, a, a mat and a team of emulators on staff, knowing that those bad guys are out there and how they're behaving and how they're going to go after your environment. I know in our partnership with our, our friends over at MITRE Ingenuity, um, their SOC assessments is very much that way, right? Like here's the entire MITRE attack framework. Yep. Which of these techniques can your team identify and yep. detect? Well, there's... 300 some odd techniques and sub-techniques. So it's still a question of 
how do I prioritize that? But if you know what you have that the bad guys want, and you know what that kind of bad guy is typically going to do, all of a sudden that 350 techniques becomes far less, and I can prioritize the detections for the techniques that are likely to show up based on what the bad guys are actually doing. Um, Curious for your comments on that, kind of how that shows up. Am I on base? Um, What do you have to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly and, and, and then I'll keep it quiet on because I don't want to hog the time, but you're exactly right. And, and another point to that is as your, your threat intelligence team becomes more sophisticated, you can then have teams that are strategically oriented, that can drive business decisions about, hey, if we move into this space, what are the threat actors going to be? How is that going to impact our bottom line? What, what things are we going to run against, right? And, and so one other thing I was, I was just thinking of uh, was that really when you have really good IR analysts who become threat hunters, they become almost reverse red teamers because they are looking for those things in like Elk or Splunk or QRadar or whatever the tool is, right? They're looking for those indicators. So they have to know, kind of like with Owen, like they know the things that, that I'm going to do. It can't just be, I just check logs all day. And that's a sign of, of true maturity. And, and part of that is a very robust threat intelligence team that, that, that fills that information and fills those gaps in. Because like you said, there's tons of things on MITRE's attack framework, you know, tons, some techniques out the yin yang, like you said, Owen. But when you start to think like, what are actual threats going to be to our organization? Well, maybe not, you know, FIN 10, but FIN 7, definitely. Maybe not, you know, whatever new group, you know, like crazy squirrel isn't so much, but fuzzy panda would be right. So now you can kind of hem it down to, all right, we know these are our top 10. We do an assessment every year or six months. We know these are the groups. And that information again, goes back to that other point feeds into red team and red team runs the exercises. So then the threat hunters and IR like Omen, like we got you on lock. Cause we know that if someone came in with that nonsense, we would catch them in a heartbeat. So yep. I'll shut up now. <laughs> narrowing, it's all about narrowing that scope. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You're adding the layers to narrow the scope of, of what your potential, you know, threat vectors could be, you know, to the outside parties. Um, it, I mean, the more you do of it, the better you get at detecting it manually. But then hopefully, you know, you add some automation and detections into, into the mix so that you can prioritize other things. You know, you, you got that taken care of. Okay, let's move on to something different um, and just continuously grow your uh, security posture. Yeah, I think you mentioned something interesting, uh, both of you did indirectly uh, in that you can have all those detections set up, you can have a really rich and healthy uh, cyber threat team that's passing all those things off and the red team is cooperating really well and operating really well with IR, with the defensive core team. And you can still use CTI in a new way too, right? So if Somebody like Owen can go in and get a new CTI report and hear about a new threat or an old threat doing something in a new way, yep. and you can start hunting for that, right? So are we seeing that? Mm-hmm. Is it mm-hmm. already here? If I do this in cooperation with the red team, hey, here's the latest CTI report I got. I think we're prepared to detect this, but I'm not sure. So can you go ahead and bake this into your next uh, your next emulation with us to make sure that we can detect it? and Yep. You can start, you know, oh, and you mentioned it at the top, and I agree completely that we're defenders seems like we're always playing catch up. But I think when we start doing some of this really well and maturing here, we can start to get further ahead of the curve than we have in the past yes. um, and really start looking for and being proactive about um, what detections we're putting in place, what rules we're putting in place, making sure that we're not just getting alert fatigue uh, for analysts looking in the sim and really leveraging CTI. Um, in a meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, one of one of the main points I actually wrote down for this podcast was, was correlation. I mean, and that that ties right into to CTI, and all it also ties into to other types of of data that you may have that can help bring context to what you're seeing. I think it's it's invaluable. The more the merrier, in my opinion. Um, the, it just adds that little bit of of tip off to whether this could be something legitimate or no, this is systems engineer running nightly patching. You know, it, it all the, the more to, to bring in and correlate the data uh, really gives you that, that extra edge. 
Agreed. Yeah, and I know there are a lot of tools that do a whole lot more of that correlation, a lot better than they used to when cybersecurity was a, a much younger field. But I, I, there is still a healthy amount of the human element of that, Owen, that, you know, we did this campaign, I was just reading about this threat, and I saw these two alerts come in relatively quickly, and something just doesn't feel right. I know from my experience here that something's not right. And that, I think that's that's a really hard and irreplaceable piece of all of this that it's yeah. hard to tool out. So looking at threats, looking at threat groups and what they do, how they operate, how they think, you know, getting in Matt's head or having a little mat on your shoulder when that alert pops up and then that next one pops up a week later and you go, wait, this feels like something, even though it's a week apart, are they, are they rolling slow and steady to try to get through detections? It, it, you just really can't replace it. And I, I think, no. you know, cyber threat intelligence and, and campaigns and emulations like this are really, really helpful in, in, in giving people those skills and that kind of inherent radar. Yeah. Agreed. I know we are coming up about on time. It's been a phenomenal conversation thus far, and I know that there's more we want to talk about. So we're going to Go ahead and tease episodes two. Um, I have the privilege of having Matt and Owen join me uh, on the next Cyberry podcast as well to talk a little bit more about, you know, in execution of this campaign, how we did this in a really cooperative way. Um, you know, you'll hear it referred to, and some are tired of the term already, but in a purple team uh, approach to this. And, you know, I'll say from my seat, it was really interesting to see. Uh, we have the range environment all set up. Matt has an idea about what he's going to do. Owen kind of knows what Matt's going to do, but Matt goes in, throws a little bit of a curve ball, and all of a sudden, a detection's not working right. And so it's like, well, wait, why is this not working? Well, wait, oh, Matt, dang it, you dang did it. this or that. <laughs> um, and just the interplay of that as this campaign was developed, we'll have the opportunity to, to dive into a little bit and talk through some of our logic and our thought processes about why we built the campaign the way that we did um, and, and how that could be useful in that that type of thinking could be useful as uh, both defenders uh, and offensive security folks uh, begin to deploy some of these types of engagements within their environments and uh, look at the threat actor campaign on the Cyberry platform as well. So thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, any parting thoughts uh, before we, you know, take a two week break and come at it again uh, on the next episode. Learn MITRE, <laughs> really understand it and try to, Try to figure out how you can implement it. I mean, narrowing that that focus really from a defensive side. Yeah, I'd say it's definitely that. Uh, trust uh, trust your CTI reports and, and and don't be afraid to engage in open red teams because you never know what what the red team is going to shake out. That might be a lesson learned. So that, that's a plug from my side of the business. But uh, I digress. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much for the time today, and I look forward to the next episode. <laughs>